Revelation chapter 22. Title of the message, What Will Heaven Be Like? Our eternal heavenly home. If you'd like to know more about it, where we're going to spend eternity. You know, we started this series of sermons through Revelation on the first day of June. So we spent seven months in this blessed book. And uh, you remember at the beginning, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, there's a blessing that goes with this book. It says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep these things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So I hope you've been blessed by our study in this wonderful book. And Michael Faraday was a noted English chemist and physicist, very well a devout Christian. One day a distinguished scientist asked him, he said, have you conceived for yourself what your occupation will be in the next world? Hesitating a while, he said, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Then he said, I shall be with Christ. And that's enough. That's enough. Just to know we're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Heaven above all things means that. That's only a part of it. We looked at the, this morning a description in chapter 21. And we get a further description as we go into chapter 22. As he talks about New Jerusalem. And we kind of move inside the city to discover uh, what's there. So let's look at this in chapter 22. We're going to look at the first seven verses tonight. John says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. Can you say amen to that? But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Then we have the words of Jesus. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Let me share with you three words tonight from our text. First, there's a word about our eternal home. As John continues his tour, uh, who was it? Was it Sheila said that she wants to be a tour guide in heaven? That would be a good job to have, wouldn't it? Be a tour guide. Well, John's our tour guide here, giving us a tour of the New Jerusalem, the capital of heaven. And he talks about a river of water of life. He sees this beautiful river flowing through the city of New Jerusalem. Reminds me of what the psalmist said over in Psalm 46, verse 4. He said, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Let me give you a description of this river. He says, first of all, that it's pure and clear as crystal. No defilement about this river. No trash on the banks. No junk scattered along the bottom. Its waters are not murky, not muddy. 
It's a dazzling, sparkling stream, as clear as it can be. Now, you know, most cities are built along the banks of important rivers. But what do they do to those rivers? Not long, they become polluted by the cities to which they gave rise. But here's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. This is no muddy river. This is pure as crystal. The very essence of life itself. It symbolizes both pleasure and prosperity. Write these verses down in your notes. Psalm 36 verse 8. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the, of the river of thy pleasure. Then in Psalm 1, 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whosoever he doeth shall prosper. So you see pleasure and prosperity involved here. And think about where this stream originates. It proceeds out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So the source of the river is God's throne. And we've talked about that throne through our study. I guess it's going to be a source of terror for the unbelieving sinner. But it's a source of eternal life for those of us who know the Lord Jesus. You know, the Holy Spirit's likened to a river in the Bible, isn't it? Jesus said over in John 7, 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And no doubt the Holy Spirit is the reality behind that symbol. Remember in Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel saw a stream of water flowing from the temple. And he followed it. At first it was ankle deep, then it was hip deep, then it was deep enough to swim in. That river flowed from the temple. This river flows from the throne of God. And uh, the second thing I want you to see is the depiction. The depiction of this river. You'll notice this is a water of life. See, it's not like any other river we've known. It symbolizes our eternal life. One commentator said this. He said it's pure, unpolluted, Unobstructed flow symbolizes the constant flow of everlasting life from God's throne to God's people. It's a symbol of our eternal home. Folks, this is not a temporary home we're talking about. This is our eternal home where we will dwell for all eternity. What a glorious, beautiful place this is going to be. I mean, what we're seeing here is just tip of the iceberg. I mean, the story is, is uh, not yet been told what this is going to be like. We like to sing Amazing Grace, don't we? There's a verse in there that says, When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amen. Amen. Second, I want to talk to you about a word about our eternal health. Not only is there a river, there's a tree, a tree of life. In, it says in the midst of the street and at the same time on either side of the river. The picture is that a river flows down through the middle of the city. It's large enough to span the river, the street is. And the river is in the midst of the street. And the tree spreads to both sides of the river. So evidently the, the river is not very broad. But narrow enough to allow for this arrangement. Some think there may be more than one tree of life. There may be trees on both sides. Uh, they point to Ezekiel 47 verse 12. Listen to this. He said, by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side... And on that side shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. 
and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Now that's very similar to what we're seeing in Revelation here, isn't it? This tree seems to be the counterpart of the tree we find in the Garden of Eden. Read about that back in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 9. There it says, Now the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now you remember that second tree was a test of loyalty to God, the fruit of which had been forbidden to mankind. The tree of life was not forbidden while men were still sinless. But once man had sinned, he could no longer be trusted with the tree of life. And so he was forbidden anymore to eat of that tree. So two thoughts there. First of all, we see the productivity of this tree. John says it bears 12 manner of fruits and one and yielded her fruit every month that's kind of a strange tree isn't it now, I've heard of trees uh, bearing different kinds of fruit when they go through the process of grafting but none that bears a different kind of fruit each month now you say what kind of fruit are we talking about I have no idea it may be fruit we've never heard of before it may be fruit that we're familiar with uh, maybe it's going to bear apples in January, pears in February, oranges in March, bananas in April. I'm not sure what this is. I have no idea. But it bears different kinds of fruits. So it's going to be like we're going to be part of the Fruit of the Month Club. Amen. <laughs> different fruit each month. And I'm sure that the apples won't have worms. Amen. None, none of this is going to be bad fruit. It'll all be perfect, delicious, and satisfying. Then second, we see the purpose of the tree. It says the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, why will we need healing? This seems to be a contradiction of what we've already learned about heaven. Back in Revelation 21.4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. These former things are all passed away. So, if there's no such thing as pain or sickness, why do we need a tree for healing? If we don't need healing. That's a good question, isn't it? I only ask good questions. What's the answer? The word healing here is actually from the word we get therapeutic. Instead of healing, the idea here is more of health giving. This is a health giving tree. The leaves promote the enjoyment of life and are not for correcting ills or sickness which do not exist. It speaks of that which is life giving. It represents the quality of life that we're going to enjoy in heaven. Eternal health. No cancer. No heart attacks. No ulcers. No flu. No allergies. No COVID. No COVID in heaven. We're going to enjoy perfect health forever. The leaves of the tree are for healing our they are health giving. They'll prevent any sickness, any disease. And we read there shall be no more curse. The curse that brought sickness is going to be removed. We'll not only live in heaven for all of eternal eternity, but we're going to live in perfect health for all eternity. Now let me remind you, back in the millennial kingdom. We talked about how Christ comes and during the millennial kingdom he's going to rejuvenate the earth, restore it to what it was like before sin. There's going to be a lifting of the curse but not a total deliverance from the curse. 
Because keep in mind that during the millennial kingdom, there are still going to be mortals who are lost. They'll be sinners by nature. They'll need to be saved. And so there will be death in the millennial kingdom. There's no death in the eternal ages we're talking about, but in the millennial kingdom there will be death. Isaiah 65 verse 20 tells us that. There it says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die. There's death, isn't there? The child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. So there's a curse still. During the millennial kingdom, people will die. But in the eternal ages, that curse is totally lifted. There's no more curse during the eternal ages. We read of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Possibly Adam and his posterity, had they remained sinless, would have been able to live forever by means of the tree of life. But God removed that tree after Adam sinned to not have temptation during his time as a sinner that he would eat of the tree of life and possibly be doomed forever in his sins. And therefore doomed to the same fate as Satan and his demons. So what happened to the tree of life? Where else in heaven? God removed it from the earth. It's now in heaven. And when we get to heaven, the saints in glory are going to be able to enjoy the fruit and the benefit of this tree of life. No more curse. Praise God. Amen. You know, it's interesting. The Old Testament closes with a warning in Malachi 4.6. It says, Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. There's a warning. The New Testament closes, Revelation 22, 3, and there shall be no more curse. I like the way the New Testament ends better than the Old Testament, don't you? There's a warning will come to smite the earth with a curse, but now there's a promise that there shall be no more curse. The curse of sin will be gone forever. Satan, who brought the curse upon this world, will be in the lake of fire. And uh, all creation will be made new. Thirdly, let me say a word about uh, eternal honor. A word about eternal honor. We read here, they shall reign forever and ever. And if you remember at the beginning of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, God hath made us, us believers, kings and priests. Then again in Chapter 3, verse 21, another promise. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, this is Jesus, and am set down with my Father in his throne. So it says we will reign as kings and priests, enjoying the blessings of that honor. Let me share two thoughts here. First of all, we're going to see the Lord. When we get to heaven, we shall see the Lord. Verse 4, they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, we don't have the mark of the beast on our foreheads. We have the name of the Lord Jesus to identify us. Carrie Breck wrote in her song, Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Amen. Speaks of identification. He is mine and I am his. As I said, the greatest blessing of heaven is is that we will get to see the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. It goes on to say there's no night there, for the Lord himself is the light. His very presence is the light of heaven. 
John says there should be no more night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord, Lord God giveth them. Yeah, that brought out several times, isn't it? That God will be the light of this city and of heaven. John reminds us once again, we will abide in his presence. Not only shall we see the Lord, but folks, we shall serve the Lord. Now some people may thought, well, you mean we're going to have to work in heaven? I thought we were going to get to sit on the clouds and pluck a harp for all eternity. You know, I think after a million years, I'd get tired of that, wouldn't you? I, I hope there's more to do than pluck on a harp for all eternity. I'd be, that would be, you know, it'd be strange for some to actually serve since they don't do it here. Uh, I mean, seriously, there's some you can't get to strike a lick at a snake. As the old timers used to say. I said, Brother West, aren't you an old timer? As a matter of fact, I guess I am. Thanks for bringing it up. But in heaven, we're going to serve the Lord. Even us old timers are going to serve the Lord. Of course, there won't be any old timers in heaven. We're all going to be young. But uh, there's going to be something to do. Something we'll enjoy. I don't know what's going to be, but whatever it is, our service will be perfect. <laughs> don't you wish our service was perfect now? Uh, there's so much lacking when we try to do, even in our worship. But there's coming a day when we'll serve the Lord perfectly. His every wish will be our command. We're going to wait on the Lord, we're going to work for the Lord, and we're going to love every moment of it. Amen. So long as Christ is on the throne, so long as life endures, we will share in his glory. They shall reign forever and ever. There's no greater joy, folks, than serving the Lord God. To just serve him for all eternity. Now, by the way, if we're going to do it for all eternity, some of you might want to get started now. Just so you won't be completely behind when we get there. there. There's times we can serve the Lord here. Be involved in his service, ministry. Then in verses 6 and 7, in closing. We're reminded these things we've seen must shortly be done. That means when it happens, it's going to happen suddenly. It's going to happen suddenly. Behold, I come quickly, the Lord says. I think this is a reference to the rapture when he comes as a thief in the night. But probably in the large context, it just speaks of his coming both phases. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the, the blessings here. Keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book and you are promised a blessing. Now, though we're coming to an end of this study, as there is a blessing to read this book and study the book. I want to encourage you to do that. And when you've got time, open up the book of Revelation and read it again. And just meditate upon these things and how soon these things are going to come to pass. Our attention is drawn to the faithful word of God, to the finished work of Christ, to the final witness of of the Holy Spirit. What an appropriate way to end the Bible. It started that way with the Trinity. I mean, God said, let us make man in our image, our likeness. That's the Trinity speaking. And now at the end, the Trinity is involved in our eternal home. So let me ask you this. Will you reign forever and ever with the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, where will you spend eternity? Where are you going to spend eternity? Have you been born again? Brother Russ, as we come and have an invitational hymn, let me remind you, what you do with Christ will determine what Christ will do with you. If you reject him, he will reject you. 
But if you receive him, he will receive you. 